Ted and I, we were both, we met in our freshman year at University of Texas in 19, in late um, 67. And um, really we were the only two hippies in our freshman class at the time. And uh, that's sort of how we became friends. We recognized each other as sort of, uh, we look like you're into the same thing I'm into and vice versa. So uh, we became friends. Um, uh, Ted was a much more disciplined, better student than I was. So he was getting good grades. Uh, we were in all the same classes uh, because we were in a thing called uh, Plan 2. I think it was, yeah, Plan 2 plan, or Plan B. Uh, plan 2. I think it's called Plan 2. Well, this is before yeah, was, it was RTF. Was, Sorry? It was, it was before RTF. Yeah. This is our freshman year. It was a uh, liberal arts program that we're in for, for people because I had good SAT scores. I just wasn't very disciplined as a student. And um, Ted, of course, was both a uh, good, had good test scores and a good student. Uh, but at the end of the first year, um, while that was going on, um, of course, the war in Vietnam was going on and everybody was protesting the war in Vietnam, the Students for a Dem Democratic Society, the SDS, and several other organizations on campus at the University of Texas at the time in Austin uh, would bring in 16 millimeter film prints of classic films, Fellini, Kurosawa, Bergman, you name it, the, the greats of cinema, um, which you have to keep in mind that in 1967, videotape does not exist, right? So that if you, not unlike totally the antithesis, antithesis of what we have today, if you wanted to see a film, you better be in, especially if it was a Kurosawa film or a Bergman film or Fellini, you better be in a major city the week that it showed. Yeah, Otherwise, theater. Get about it, right? was, was that the Cinema 40 um, uh, group that put on those uh, European art films? Cinema there, were several, there, were several, there were several different organizations that, that did it. And um, I, I don't remember, I don't recollect Cinema 40 as one. It was more about people that were political activists that were trying to raise money to print brochures, to get, uh, to get protest permits, to, to do that kind of stuff is what ostensibly what they were trying to raise money. But anyhow, to, uh, uh, I was not that politically involved, but I, I fell in love with these films. I mean, it's, uh, imagine I'm seeing Seven Samurai, I'm seeing Eight and a Half, I'm seeing all these films for the first time. And there are 16 millimeter prints that they would bring in. Uh, and um, it was phenomenal. And I didn't, I, I realized right away, I don't give a fuck about these classes that I'm supposed to be taking this general liberal arts education. But this film, this is, this is you know, what interests me. Uh, and after one year of not very good grades because I wasn't trying that hard, uh, I was uh, probably another semester of grades like I had, I'd probably be tossed out, uh, which at that time there was a draft and it probably meant that I was going straight to Vietnam if I didn't get my shit together. So I was in Ted's apartment at the end of the year, flipping through the course book, 32,000 students at the University of Texas at Austin at that time. And I'm flipping through the course book and flipping through and flipping through. And the very, very last thing in it is the Department of, Communi uh, Department of Communication. And in the And within the School of Communications was the Department of Radio, Television, and Film. And um, I said, Ted, there's a film school here. He goes, well, what, what can they teach you in the film school? I go, well, I don't know, but I'm going. And I uh, went, went to the class on the first day. Uh, there were about 20 of us in the class. And uh, the professor said, uh, look, this is a closed industry. 1967, it's absolutely true what you said. There's, there's three networks. There's a PBS in addition. New York has one or two free, uh, what do they call it? independent stations and Chicago has one. That's it, right? Austin, Texas at the time didn't even have the three networks. LBJ owned the television yeah. station okay. and it, was, it went back and forth between two networks depending upon what LBJ thought we should, we should be watching. And um, so uh, about half the kids got up and walked out when he said, this is a closed industry, you can't get into it. There's not a demand for, there are only six studios at the time, not all this independent cinema. And he goes, you can't get it. You, you're not gonna make it in this industry. If you're passionate about filmmaking, you'll stick it out. You'll get a, a, a master's degree, eventually a PhD, you'll teach film. And if you're fortunate, you'll get a grant and you'll make films on the weekends or in the summers. Well, it didn't sound very 
spectacular or it's a terribly inviting situation to go into. But I'm sitting there thinking to myself, well, you know, I need, I need for my parents to, to pay for me to go to school. And I, there's not anything else I'm interested in. So I guess I just got to stick this out. About half the class got up and left. There were left probably 10 or 11 of us left. They go, okay, you guys, we're going to make a film. And, uh, you know, it's going to be, we, I don't know, somehow we decided it would be a Western. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure who wrote the script. But they go, okay, anybody have any experience with a camera? And I go, yeah, well, I, I've shot some Super 8. Because when I was 13 years, I was 13 years old when a skateboard was invented. Lived in a very hilly town in New Jersey. Recently repaved all the streets. And my buddies and I lived on our skateboards. And after about six months of that, I went into Manhattan and bought an eight millimeter camera. An old, one of the old, uh, not even super, it was an old eight, flip over eight millimeter cameras. And uh, for about five or six months, just, just shot footage, not really trying to tell a story, just trying to make cool shots of, of my buddies. And so um, that was a bit of a, uh, you know, so I go, yeah, well, I've, I've worked at camera before. Okay, you're the cinematographer. Well, um, I happen to be strong math sciences, which cinematography, when it was film, it's always been an art, but it's a very technical art, and you needed to use a lot of math and science uh, to, to be a cinematographer in the old days. That's, it's, it's still some, but not as much today. Right. Uh, film's faster. Uh, lights don't require the kind of electricity, the LED lights and stuff like that. So it's, it's less of a strain. It's become shifted more and more towards the art side, which is a good thing. Um, but uh, anyhow, I went out, we shot this Western black and white. I, somehow I learned about the black and white filtration. I killed it. I mean, the skies were rich, you know, white, the white, you know, you're in Austin. So you know how Austin, I, I refer to Austin as a place that has a checkerboard of clouds. Yeah. It's never just all blue and it's never just all cloud. It's always dotted like blue skies and checkerboard clouds. Well, with the right filtration of black and white, that can look incredibly dramatic. Um, we shot another scene in tall grass. Um, uh kind of like um terrence malick you terrence thank you for yeah for, good, good, good. for another austin guys uh we had that so that was blowing i was riding his horse across this field the grass is blowing we shot a sequence in the forest and um uh while we were loading into there i noticed that everybody walked down the path the dust kicked up and the sun was shining through the trees so before we, every shot i'd make everybody go out and drag their feet around in the path we get the dust up and then we roll smoking it was, it was my early early days of, of smoke adventures so anyhow um it w worked out really well right away everybody said oh shoot my film shoot my film. almost almost overnight became like a staff cinematographer for the film school mm -hmm. uh went through it for a year had a, you know had a great time there and um the following year ted switched over uh, and, and became, uh, or maybe it was halfway through the semester, you know, the, the, the break in the mid, mid year. Um, but anyhow, he came to film school and then we started, he and I started making films together because I was a shooter, he was more of a writer director and a perfect pairing for, 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 for ourselves. You know, he was that, that seed that I needed because if you don't have good sh things to shoot, what's the point? And somebody can't capture it, he needed, you know, so reinforced our friendship and uh, we made quite a few films together. Uh, we went to graduate school together, which are where I continued there and, and shot for the seven or eight directing students that were there, but I, was, I shot all their films. Um, a guy named Larry Carroll, I don't know if you've spoken to Larry or not, Larry. Not yet, he's on Facebook, I know. Uh-huh, well, Larry uh, was, uh, at that time, he was a year ahead of us and um, he, uh, and this actually is, I didn't even know this story until I learned it from Gunner and Gunner's book, uh, the way this went down. But uh, Larry had a uh, contract for us to make a lot of films for the state, uh, for the department, DPS, you know, Department of okay. Public Safety, basically the Jack, state. Jack Hansen, right? You have that deal? Yeah. Jack Hansen was also, he was a connect in that, yes. Canceling. Yeah, that was when you were uh, in shootout though, right? That was, that, was, that was with the company shootout, but but we were still... I mean, we were, it's, it's, it's a bit of a weird timeline. Do you know when, did we, do you, you may know, you may know or recollect this better than I do some of this stuff, right? Um, keep in mind, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot older than I look, I'm 71 years old, right? So, you know, um, people have guessed me in my middle fifties, but my, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I remember everything exactly as it was, but shootout. My recollection is that I was immediately out of film school. Yeah, it would have been 71, 73. Yeah, 
I was three weeks out of getting my master's degree when Toby hired me, said that I was the best, said that he'd seen my stuff and I was the best cinematographer in the state of Texas. And he wanted a Texan to shoot the picture. Although I didn't really consider myself a Texan at the time. I was happy to, to sound as much like I could, like one at, uh, then. Um, from but, New Jersey originally, right? Sorry, what's that, excuse me? You're from New Jersey originally, aren't you? New Jersey, New Jersey yeah, New Jersey boy, yeah. Um, so uh, the story that Gunnar tells, which makes as much sense to me as anything else, that we made a, a drug bust film for the Department of Public Safety. That would have been a, jo a contract that Larry had that I shot for him. And uh, that would have been a shootout job. And that's, that's what Gunnar believes that Toby saw that yeah. got me the job. Now, I don't, I wouldn't have thought that we had shootout until after we finished um, Chainsaw. If we finished Chainsaw, but I think you we had it. Did uh, maybe you know what? Do you know, know what we started? Sorry, excuse me. Do you know when we started shootout? Um, well, I know you guys met, um, you know, first Larry later on, but uh, Courtney Gooden and uh, Richard Courtney, Chorus there as well. Richard, Richard Chorus. Richard Dick. Dick was a. Uh, was originally uh, our, our, our professor, yeah. uh, you know, um, and that's where we knew him from. I had a very brief stint um, where I was assisting, gaffing and gripping for him. I was doing everything for him. I was, sometimes I'd be pushing the dolly and pulling focus at the same time for him. Uh, but I did that for about three months and decided that I, I, I could do it. I didn't need to, to, to practice any longer. That I was good enough that I could just go on off by myself. But I think you guys came together I'm not sure if it was called shootout now, but I believe you did that uh, that drug bust uh, you know training film, and that's what I think Toby himself says he saw. You must have had shootout uh, during because um, I think according to Larry, the film was edited in the shootout offices. Yes, that's for sure. And in fact, uh, they got close-ups on the eyeball stuff like that were shot there as well. So we, so obviously we had it, and. We had an editing machine there, a uh, Steenbeck editing machine. Yeah, but I was wondering about the, the timeline there were too, a shootout, but also I was very curious about, you know, besides that, that Western you made uh, at UT, which uh, I, I was curious about the name of that, but also that film you made with uh, Ted, where he's in uh, Sets of the Birds, So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star for the Vulcan Gas Company. Uh-huh. Yeah, where, where, yeah, where was that? Sorry? Uh, when was that and, and what, what was the deal? So you want to be a rock and roll star was um, after, after we did the Western, the in like, this is uh, fall of 68. So the first film we made was a Western. Now it's time to make our own film. And um, I went out with a Bolex and Ted was a singer in a rock and roll band at that time. And they were playing. And I went and I, um, have you ever seen any imagery from that? No, I, I heard you were re restoring it. I know you made some experimental films for, for the Vulcan. I, I guess work there, shooting films. Yeah, I, I did. I, 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 because wow, these things are so intertwined. I hope you can put, I'll put it back yeah. in a proper order wherever you're dealing with it. Uh, my freshman year there, my first year, uh, got into psychedelics, you know, got into drugs because that's what was going on. Was a hippie thing was happening. And the Vulcan Gas Company was the place to be. And that's where the girls were. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's why I would go there every Friday and Saturday night. And um, when I went home at Christmas, there was, a, there was a light show there and there was showing slides and they had, um, right. I don't even know what it's called. There's a, they had, it was like a, a, a pulsing amoeba, very, very, thing that happened a lot in the 60s in the psychedelic days uh, where you'd put uh, colored fluids that were wouldn't mix into a like a, a, a clock face a big, and then another clock face of a slightly different uh, pitch or curve would go on top of it in an overhead projector yeah. and you would pulse these colors and project it onto the wall. So that would be the centerpiece and there were slides being shown around it. Liquid light but, though. Sorry, what's that? A liquid light show. And yeah. I think, uh, you know, the Conqueroo, where 
Ed Gwynn. Bonkaroo was a band with Ed Gwynn, yeah. House band, right. But I think they had the first liquid light show projection like that before any San Francisco band did. Jomo Disaster was the name of the company. That right, that was, that was the San Francisco. Jomo Disaster was in San Francisco. Um, right? Well, oh, I, was I, I thought they were from Austin. Oh, that, that could be because the name's very familiar. Hmm. Very, very familiar. Well, <laughs> This is crazy, man. The, the history you got. Whatever you, whatever you publish in the end, you put, make sure you get it to me so I can put my life back together the way it happened. Anyhow, uh, I uh, I went home at Christmas and I grabbed my Super Eight, my eight millimeter camera, not my Super, and my eight millimeter camera and my projector, and I brought them back to Austin. And I climbed, went to the Driscoll Hotel and I climbed up on a table and I swiped a chandelier off the, uh, a crystal off the chandelier, took my camera outside and I put the crystal between the lens and the sun and got all these strange flares going on and, and you know, uh, the uh, rainbow effect of, that, a, that a good piece of glass can make, a prism. And um, was doing that. And then I like, get like red bottles and blue bottles and, and shoot things and put the bottles in and out of the lens. I uh, went to the headlight of my car and got close to it and just put my hand in it and made all different weird shapes moving just just about light and shadow and just just really just to just tickle your eyeballs is what it was all about like like I said again not really telling a story just making images that I thought were cool when I got about 10 12 minutes of that together I went to see the guys at the light show and um, and said look you know I, I've got this footage and I'd like like to join I showed it to him and uh, became friends with Jim Franklin at that time. I mean, oh, yeah. you, must, you must know Jim Franklin. Who's the poster guy. And he's friends with Bob Burns, too. With uh, Bob he, Burns. Uh, I, I didn't get to know Bob until we made Chainsaw. But you're saying, but uh, it makes all the sense in the world that, that uh, Jim and Bob would have been friends. Uh, that make that makes a lot of sense, but uh, so they brought they got me into you know they put me into the light you know they let me join the light show, and. Um, so then, you know, I'd been shooting. So that was my freshman year. So I'd been shooting some more again when it came time to make that Western. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd been, been back at it. And, um, you know, there's a little bit of a tradition. Um, you know, it's a, it's a funny thing about cinematography uh, because, I, as I mentioned to you, it's, a, it's an art, but it's a very, very technical art. And um, when it was filmed, you, you could not function as a cinematographer without having your shit together. You had to know how to, you know, make a light meter, interpret the results of what the light meter told you, how to change your f-stop or your shutter angle for various film speeds, etc. And, um, you know, ordering lights and things like that, how to do it. Uh, but uh, my parents sort of set me up well for that. My mother, not successful, but she was a, uh, an amateur painter, but painting was her hobby. And uh, my father was a, uh, was a successful mechanical engineer. So they gave me the two sides that I needed. You know, I got I got the math science side from my father and 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 this, the art eye from my mother. And throughout my career, I continued to consult with my, you know, my, while he was alive, with my father on big rigs. If I had to do stuff really big, because that's what he did. He was he did massive big mechanical uh, engineering uh, jobs. So if I had something big going on, I'd always talk to him about the best way to approach it. Yeah. Um you, were you always, uh, in, did you always intend to be a, a cinematographer when you got into the RGF? Did that it, it just fall into your lap? Yeah, it, it, it did. When I, when I um, for, for a number of reasons. One, I'm left-handed. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a very, I'm more balanced now because I've had to explain myself so many times. But at that time, I was, my, S, my SAT scores will give you a good idea of what kind of a, a person I was. 780 math. 520 verbal okay so you had to have above five to go to college and you had to have a total of 1200 well, i had a total of 1300 so i could go but two more questions wrong on the on the verbal part of, on the english part of the verbal uh and the english part of it i probably would not have been able to go to college but um it's funny i took uh, my daughter got to a point where she was going to take the test and i got a sample for her, because she was going to be very young when she was taking it. She wanted to go to a special program. So I took the test again myself. And I got a 1300 again, um, but I got a 660 and a 640. So I became, I balanced because I wasn't practiced at the high level math, doing trig that, uh, on a regular basis like we did in school. And um, 
Also, I'd had to learn to write, to present my ideas. So I'd had to learn how to communicate better. Um, but I don't know, are you left-handed or right-handed? Uh, right-handed. I, I, I'm a believer that we lefties have a lot of uh, advantages because we, you yeah. know, especially in the arts, because we I see heard. things from a slightly different way. I mean, we're one out of eight in society, but one out of three in the arts. Um, but at the same time, I also believe that we have reading and, and therefore reading disabilities and therefore because of the dyslexia and then because we're natural dyslexics and then it comes to the reading disability, which then, you know, just sort of leaves you behind and things literary, literary, you're not really, you know, like uh, reading is, no, 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 you know, you, know, you still, it's just a struggle. Um, so i uh, not even sure why I went down that road, but, uh, I, oh, so I think I realized right away, well, the two things, you asked me why, why I was drawn to cinematography. Uh, it just seemed natural because what I had done some, I used to shoot black and white stills too. I had a, an old box camera that when I, I'd get my milk, my army guys and, and trucks and stuff set up and I'd just stand this camera down in the dirt and shoot, you know, box camera stills too. So I'd always played around with photography. Uh, I have an aunt who, who at the time when I was young was a professional photographer, uh, my father's sister. So that, that makes sense too. She and I remained close up until she passed away a year ago. Um, but um, uh, it just seemed like to me, filmmaking, it all centered around this box with this piece, with this lens on it, right? That that's, this is like the center of that universe is this camera. So it seemed like the, the natural place for me to be if you wanted to have any say so and what was going going on with the films from me, uh, you know, from my standpoint, not being a writer, uh, that that the technical aspect of, of, and the way I could influence the art of what was going on was through the photography, the cinematography. And I do remember t saying to myself when I decided it, this is right, right, right when we shot that first film my sophomore year and everybody went crazy for it and I went yeah this is what I'll do I'll be a cinematographer and and, and uh you know I, I'll work in Paris I'll work in Rome I'll work all over the world and it has absolutely come true for me I guess you were shooting mostly student films then and maybe the one uh drug bust and and the Conqueru uh not the, the Vulcan so you want to be a rock and roll star I, I did hear that aired on on PBS well, so, so you want to be a rock and roll star is a whole very long, very long story, but I, I can tell it, tell it to you. You called her Roger uh, McGuinn? Uh, yeah, so what, what happened was um, uh, we, ha we went out and I made this, uh, went and shot my, Ted and his buddies. And Ted's the singer in this. Uh, a psychedelic rock band, he said. I they, they, were, they were a cover band, you know, they, they did a lot of covers. They'll tell Laura I love her, that kind of stuff. But um it was not, they're not, you know, they, they covered everything. It wasn't original stuff, but mostly it was, it was covers. And, um, but I just shot it with no song in mind, but I decided I was going to cut it just so you want to be a rock and roll star. So I, um, uh, I spent a lot of time editing it and, and I put it on A and, a and B rolls. Uh, are you familiar with that? When it, back in the old days when it was filmed, you would actually make like a checkerboard in order to make invisible edits or not have the splice show up across the edit. You would splice the film in such a way so that the first shot would be on the A roll. The second shot would be on the B roll. Third shot would be on the A roll. Fourth shot would be on the B roll. They would go, go back and forth like that. And that way you could have invisible splices, not see, not see the tape or anything. Well, I was reconstructing my rolls and running them through. I made a total of four rolls, sometimes using the same footage. Sometimes I'd take a shot and flip it left or right and print it back on top of itself. Sometimes like with the drummer, slow motion on the drummer, bringing the stick down, I'd, slow, I'd back it up six frames and print it and I'd get it, get it and back it up six frames and print it a third time, back it up six times and print it a fourth time. So I ran that film through the contact printer many times, re-scrambling the footage from one take to the next, okay? I This is the first filmmaking class, so Dick Corus is the professor. Mm -hmm. right? uh, there's about 12, about, like I said, about 11 or 12 of us left in the class, and um, I'm about fifth or sixth to show my film, and 
he goes, Daniel, he goes, uh, is your film? I go, yeah, he goes, you come with me. And we walk out of the room, right? <laughs> and we go sit down, it was in an old mansion that was on the corner of the, of the campus, the film school, incredible facility for us. Unlike, it was open 24 hours a day for us. We could go in there, we could make films. I mean, it was what we needed. Uh, and, and those of us that were graduates really protested when they changed and went into the building and it, had, you know, it was closed at these hours at six or seven or eight, whatever it was. We're going, no, filmmaking is, is a 24 hour a day process. You know, you need that. You need the time, when, especially when we're learning, especially in the editing of it. But anyhow, um, uh, he takes me and we walked you know, to his office, who's also in the same, in the same building, and starts talking to me. And about five minutes into it, I go, hey, you know, we left the rest of the class, the rest of the class back there. And he goes, don't worry about it. They haven't got it. You have it. They haven't got it. Don't worry about it. I'm going, all right, well, this is pretty odd, but okay. Uh, at, at that point, he then um, proposed that I work with him as, you know, be his, his assistant and his gaffer and stuff, and which I, like I said, I did for for three months and really Larry, I started shooting with Larry Carroll. I started shooting with Larry Carroll around that time. And um, he, uh, you know, then when I started shooting for Larry, that, that broke me of the, of the habit of being, I'm turning the volume down here on my thing. Okay, so in case somebody walks by my doorbell, it doesn't ring again. But I want to back up and finish up on, on rock and roll star for you. Right. It later got known, known as rock and roll nose. Um, so, uh, they, they all love it. They sh uh, Cora shows it to the other professors. They decide it's fantastic. We're going to sell this to PBS for you. I'm going, what? And they go, yeah, how much did it cost you to make the film? I said, $275. So I get a call back. All right. They're going to, they, they, they want it. They want you to sign these papers. They're going to give you, pay you back the 275 you have into it. I'm thinking, this is fucking incredible. I make one film and already I'm break even. I mean, Wow. This is going to, this is fantastic, right? This is, keep in mind, this is early 1968, right? So um, they go, yeah, but we need, uh, we need the rights to the song. And I go, the rights to the song? I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, we need to, we can't just put the song on television. You got to get a release from, from the birds. So yeah, they hooked me up with, with uh, Roger McGuinn, uh, the guys at Vulcan Gas Company, which is, this is an important part of the story because I would have had no way to find him yeah. other than I went back to the Vulcan Gas Company who had all the contacts from booking all of the rock acts, right? They knew how to put me in touch. And it still blows my mind. Somehow here I am now, 19 year old kid and I'm on the phone with, with Roger McGuinn and I tell him my story and he goes, yeah, sounds cool, man. He goes, yeah, like, you know, yeah, 3000 bucks. I go, okay, cool. So I hang up the phone. Uh, you know, I go next day or whatever, I report back to the professor. Okay, yeah, well, yeah, McGuinn says we can have the rights for 3,000 bucks. They go, what are you fucking crazy? I go, what do you mean? They go, we're giving you $275 for the film. We can't throw another 3,000. That's more than 10 times what we're, you know, we're giving you. We're, we, I go, well, oh, shit. So I go back and I tell Ted and his, and his buddies, I go, well, guys, I'm sorry. You know, I know you're all going to th think you're going to be on national television. It's going to be great. We're all excited about it. They're not going to $3,000 for the rights to the song, and it's over. You know, it's not going to happen. And they go, well, wait, wait, wait. They go, we'll make you a new song. And I'm going, yeah, but guys, I, I, you know, I can't re-edit it. This took me like two weeks and re-scrambling the footage and re-editing it. You're going to make me a new song. It's got to be cut to a different tempo. I, I, I haven't got the time to dedicate to this, to re-edit to re it, to make it work. Oh, no, no, it won't We'll make it the exact same beats per minute. It'll be the exact same length and the exact same beats per minute. You won't have to re-edit it at all. You'll just lay it up against, against it. I mean, we can do that? Go, yeah, yeah, we can do that. They go, I go, okay, cool, well, let's do it. They go, yeah, one problem. They go, um, there's a uh, our lead guitar player, Fast Ike Ritter. This guy was a bit of a speed freak, and uh, Fast Ike Ritter. He was the month of missing. Uh, the lead guitar player couldn't find. Him. Nobody knew where he was. He'd go on these benders and he'd disappear for weeks at a time. So um, they go, but you know, again, like we're all you're like you know, we're 19, 19, 20 years old. All of us. They go, oh, well, there's this old, this older guy, Jimmy Vaughn. We'll get him to come play lead guitar. All right, cool. All right, well, yeah, that's fine. And I get a four track recorder and we're gonna record it in my apartment, which is on the second story. 
And of course, we're smoking marijuana because that's what we hippies did at that time. <laughs> we just, you know, get high. And but Jimmy shows up, but with his little brother Stevie Ray, who's twelve years old at this time, okay. and who just and we get and we I'm going. He cannot come into this apartment because this is Texas, and we're he's a minor, and we're all over eighteen. And if we get we have drugs and him at the same time, we're going to jail for life. Yeah. So we wouldn't let him in. So the whole time that we're trying to record this song. Stevie Ray Vaughan is like climbing up the downspout, trying to get tap on the window. He's knocking on the door. He's, you know, almost doing oh, I got pizza for the, you know, that kind of, you know, trying to yeah, come on, you know, he's, he, he was trying to get in to the, the session the whole time we had to push him out. But anyhow, um, it did, we did, we did get it recorded. We did get the track recorded and, uh, you know, it did work out and it did air nationally. And uh, it, if I will try to remember, I have one frame from it that I have as a still frame uh, that I will, I'll send to you. It's a, it's, oh, wow. it is a shot of Ted and it's, it's uh, it, when you put, when you look at this and you go, holy shit, this is 1968. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's some pretty, uh, well, it's just, it's just the two images print flip, but you know, when he was playing guitar and as he's moving, he's go, it's going like that, you know, so it's, it's, it's quite interesting, the moving image. But it looks kind of like a rock and roll raw shock. What yeah. you'll see is the still image. It's, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see the full uh, film if you. Uh, me you too. Know. I got. I got to get off my ass and get it. Get it taken care of. And the the western too. That I'm very curious. About. Western. I I don't have. I don't know. Uh, I don't either have the western. So yeah. I was uh, curious about when. Uh, so I know you know Toby called you called you the you know best cinematographer in Texas. Uh, I think, uh, and you mentioned people being in your apartment and when you received the phone call, uh, were Ted or- Ted, I believe, I believe, I believe Ted was there and uh, a guy named Tom Herod probably was there. And there are a couple of guys that were, that I told, like I told them at the time that we graduated, I said, look guys, I think I was 23. I was 23 at that time. And I said, look, guys, I think I'm pretty good at this cinematography thing. I will shoot a feature film by the time I'm 35. I'll be the youngest cinematographer to ever shoot a feature film. And they all went, wow, that's, that's some pretty bold, some pretty bold shit. You know? And I said, yeah, but I think I can pull it off. So when I did three weeks later was when I got the phone call. And I think Ted was there. So I know my, my, my wife, Dottie Pearl, I know she was there at the time. And... And I remember hanging up the phone and coming back and I was like, I was like, you know, I'm like shaking, you know, like sparks are coming off of me. And they said, you know, um, what's going on? And I said, guys, I'm 12 years ahead of schedule. I've just been offered a feature film. Mm -hmm. And um, that was pretty amazing. Now um, also were uh, Ted and Larry uh, hired at the same time? Uh, I, I brought them on because they were, okay. they were you know, my buddies. Toby hired me. Uh, and then I brought um, Ted and Larry onto the project. Uh, and also, uh, interestingly, the story has not been told uh, very often, and you may or may not know about, uh, is that Toby wanted uh, my wife, my first wife, uh, Dottie Pearl, mm -hmm. to be to play um, the character Pam, oh. uh, the, the the second victim, the victim that gets hung on a meat hook. Um, and, uh, understandably she was, she was a pretty girl, but, um, she didn't want to be an actress and, and she was not an actress in any way, didn't want to be and said, look, if I'm going to do anything with this film, first of all, I don't even like filmmaking you guys, I, you know, she goes, my husband's gone all the time. It's, you know, I don't, even, I don't really want to be a filmmaker. I want to be an anthropologist. I go, well, that's not, that's not much demand for anthropologists, but okay. Um, so Toby goes, no, no, I want you to be play the character Pam. She goes, no, if I'm going to do anything in the film business, I'm going to be a makeup artist. Mm -hmm. And Toby goes, no, no, no. That is the one person that has to come from Hollywood, makeup artist, because that's just too big of a thing. And we can, we can sort of stumble our way through the rest of it with Texans, but that, that person's got to be proper Hollywood makeup artist. Well, uh, Toby owned a couple of lenses. And while I was um, uh, shooting uh, with the... Uh, 
uh, well, he wanted me to shoot a lens test on his lenses. He goes, Daniel, I own a couple of lenses. And I'm not sure if they're sharp enough to shoot a lens test with these lenses, would you? Yeah, so I was using uh, Dottie as a subject for these lens tests and um, about, I just think one or two more lenses to check. Uh, she goes, Can you, look, I want, I want to do a makeup job on myself. Would you, you know, I've, been do I've made myself look pretty. So now I want to do a horror job on myself. Would you let me, would you let me do it? Give me, you know, I said, what do you need? It's going to have an hour and a half, two hours. I said, yeah, go ahead. So somehow, this is hard to imagine how in 1973, she even had the, knew the formula to make stage blood. Yeah. She made stage blood. She took and put the shell of a hard boiled egg, closed her eye, put the shell over her eye, took a dried apricot and oh, she drew veins on the shell before she put it on her eye, like eyeball veins, a dried apricot and fill in the socket of the eye. So it was a swollen eye, right? Yeah. Put some, that dull white with the red and some oozy crap coming out of it, almost like snot coming out of the corner of the eye. Took raisins and sliced them down and took the blood she'd made and made like oozing scabs hmm. all over her face. And she had made the teeth that Leatherface wears, the solid, the, the filed teeth, the sawtooth teeth. She'd already, she was working for a, um, a dentist at the time. And so she made those teeth um, that, that she was hoping that, you know, that Leatherface would wear. So she did this horror job on herself. And then I said, okay, Toby, um, uh, I'd like you to come look at the test. He goes, no, man, no, no, no. Just tell me if the lens is good or not. I don't know. I, you know, I'm going, well, look, I, I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's a close call. They're your lenses. You know, he's going, well, just make a decision. I go, no, no, please, 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 just please come in and watch, you know, take a look at the test. Well, when he saw Dottie in, on the screen, he goes, oh my God. He goes, yeah, you know, that's, that's, you know, she's got the job for sure. I mean, also with an eye towards the budget, because I mean, obviously it was going to cost a lot, a lot le less money to hire her than it would have to, uh, to hire, uh, you know, somebody out of, out of Hollywood. Did a great job, was a major contributor yeah. in so many ways in the picture. Uh, you know, her con contributions are no less than mine, really. And um, uh, went on to become the first woman in the makeup union. Right. Went out to Hollywood in 76 and, uh, or so, yeah, I think it was 70, 75. No, it may have been 74, late 74, early 75. Came out to Los Angeles and went to the union and said, uh, I'd like to get in the union. Went, no, no, little girl, go away, go away. She had just turned 23 at that time. And, no, 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 go away, go away. And she goes, you know, I've noticed that I'm looking at your roster and um, there's not a single woman in your union. And will you guys give me a test or should I get a lawyer? Oh, uh, hang on, we'll give you a test. And she, she passed the test. She's a very good makeup artist and she became the first woman uh, in, the, in the Hollywood makeup union, which is quite an achievement really. Right, her work in Chainsaw, I know she worked with Bob Burns a lot, but it's, it's great. And, and that Raisin story, the whole horror job, it's funny because in that uh, behind the scenes shot of where uh, the hitchhiker uh, is, uh, you know, Ed Neal is on the floor. There's a box of raisins and her little purse with all uh, of her stuff there. Oh, yeah. the oh, it must have been because he had a couple of scabs on him, didn't he? he I get, yeah. Yeah, Ed, Ed had a, uh, Ed Neal had a, yeah. So uh, she box. got the job, uh, do, do you were recommending her, but then I guess Ted's wife at the time uh, was also the caterer. Sally. He became a caterer, yes. And I know, did Ted tell you the story about the marijuana brownies? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I asked him about that. I had to. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I don't think he remembers why she did it because no, no one knew. Um, but no, no one knew. And Gunner, uh, everyone was told, uh, I don't know if you know Michael McClary. He, he was my assistant. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. And he was just so stoned. He couldn't even get up. He was just laying down someplace. He was so high. And... Toby and I, after we ate the, the main course, we just went off to go scouting for the rest of the night. Ran off probably with Ron Bozeman and probably the three of us were not around for dessert. 
So we didn't eat the brownies and no one was told that they were marijuana yeah. brownies. But by the time that we start, got ready to start shooting again, the crew was totally fucked up and couldn't right. function. And so the three of us, Toby, myself, and Marilyn to some extent, but mostly with Gunnar, uh, continue shooting uh, that night. And Gunnar t- talks about it too, what it was like yeah. to be you know, high on the brownies. But of course, Gunnar being, you know, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever uh, tried eating marijuana brownies, but um, right, uh, he had quite a few. He said, it, "It's it, well, it, they're they're seductive in that because they taste delicious, and you don't know, if, especially if you don't know that they're going to make you high. But there's a there's numerous stories of people who even know that they're eating marijuana, still eat too much because it doesn't come on fast enough, and so I, you know it's a very very tricky thing, but yes, Sal- Sally uh, absolutely was the. Uh, she was, and uh, Ted and I were living across the street from each other at that time. So, Ted and myself and and Dottie, we'd, we'd ride into to work together, and then Sally, of course, would use would bring would come out and bring um, dinner. Another interesting story here is, uh, about Chainsaw is that Ted had a van, oh, and no. I had a van, and mine had a hundred and five inch wheelbase or one hundred and twelve. It was 112, 105, 112. And his was 123, I think. Mm-hmm. So his, Toby made the decision that his would be the shooting car because we need more room to shoot in and mine would be the grip truck. So that's basically how it broke. All the, all the gear that we made the film with, now I roll with two, two, uh, you know, two 10 ton trucks uh, is the smallest I sort of roll with now. All we had one van that was the grip truck. Anyhow, uh, sorry, I've digressed quite a bit on you. Got any questions? Um, well, I was trying to piece together more uh, of, of a timeline as far as shooting, and I, I did get to ask Ted a little about, you know, the, the early um, first week uh, from July 15th until the end of July, shooting stopped, and the reasons on why that was, and where the, the uh, dinner sequence, the end was, uh, I know it was on August 18th, but it seems like things are shot out of order, uh, like the whole night of the marijuana brownies. And there were reshoots too at the very end. You know, I was trying to figure out where those were. You know, just well, to, uh, uh, yeah, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm sorry to do this to you, but yeah, uh, no, it's the technicality that I, it's, it's, it's a reassembly, it's not a reshoot. Okay. Sure. Right? It's, it's a misnomer, not you, you didn't make it up. Most everybody in, the, in our industry, uses the wrong term. As a cinematographer, we don't like that term because it implies that perhaps something was wrong. And more often than not, it's gonna be something wrong with the photography. That's you know, something, that made the, something that made it unusable would be why you reshoot. Uh, it's additional photography. It's a, it's a bit of a reassembly, but there, there's nothing was, nothing, there, there's some additional, definitely is additional photography. And I think I've read some stuff that you've written about it. So you're, you're aware of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, uh, the crane shot with the, the body, the, 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 uh, the dead body, the corpse that's impaled on the, on the obelisk. Uh, that was part of it. Uh, going past the feedlot was part of it. Uh, Maryland, uh, the close up on Maryland's eyes. Uh, but, um, I think that's about the extent of it. Um, uh, what, what was the, what was the, what was your question I started talking about? Um, just to figure out where these were. I know the, oh, oh, the, time, the timeline issue. Right. So what happened was, um, Toby and I, and you've, uh, have you heard my version of the story of how the shot under the swing came about? Uh, yes. Yeah. We spoke on the phone a couple of years back. It, it's, it's a great, you know, story well, and you and toby fought for it yes and and, and you know but what happened was is that i'll t- uh, the, to give you the lead up to, to to what transpired uh i believe it was after a week but like i said my timeline you know it, it's not exact but right. after after a week uh they shut us down maybe it was two weeks i don't know what it was but th- they shut us down um because they thought we weren't going fast enough yeah. And the solution was going to be to uh, have Toby shot list the movie because 
Bo, Ron Bozeman, he was like the guy who had sort of seen a movie once before, added a bunch of us. I mean, seriously, we were, we were not very, you know, very knowledgeable. But they decided, uh, production decided that um, they needed a shot list, that we had to have a shot list. And you know, you guys come in here, the two of you just make the shots up as you go, and it takes too long. And you need a shot list. This can be done by the numbers, and you don't really get going and stuff. You know, Toby doesn't come in on time, and they wanted me to be able to start working without him around, etc. So they make a shot list, and on the first uh, Monday back, uh, I'm given a shot list. Now, keep in mind, this is before email and stuff, so somebody they can't even, you know, somebody has to actually mimeograph, copy this thing to me and I, you know, and so it's gotta be somebody, Toby writes it, somebody's gotta type it onto a Mimeo master in order to produce it for everybody or, you know, or however the hell we fucking copied it in 1973 and get it to me. Well, um, uh, the first day back, I go in and I set up the first shot. And I remember Toby showing up, we're, in, we're inside the house and Toby just changed the whole, he changed the whole thing. Okay, I just went with that, no, 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 no did the whole went the whole day right never shooting anything on the shot list now keep in mind that we had shut down what i think made this possible to go as stupidly as it did is that we had shut down so i think production was very busy in getting every all the permits back in place getting everything rearranged because we were just come back to work right yeah. so i think that they were while we were shooting they were very busy just with their catch-up work to get us up and running again, making arrangements for the for film, you know, for for camera, for gear, for lights, for generators, for crew, you know, just redoing, rescrambling everything. And um, on the second, the next day, we came in and I got the shot list and I set up the shot. And Toby came in and he changed it again, the same thing. And I went, Toby, what the fuck? What, what, what are you doing, man? He go, oh, down. I go. He goes, what do you mean? I go. Well, I come in here and I set up this shot, and then you come in and you change the whole damn thing. He goes, "Oh, Daniel." He goes, "They just made me do that. We're not going to do that. We're going to keep doing this the way you and I have always done it. We're going to make the shots up as with the, with block with the actors and make the shots up that work in the set, you know." Yeah. yeah. Well, they figure it out by the end of that day, the second day back, they figure it out, and they go, "Okay, now tomorrow on Wednesday, you motherfuckers are doing nothing but exactly what's on that shot list." You're shooting the shots on the shot list. If it's not on the shot list, you're not doing it. Who said well, that? Who said that? Who was saying that? Was it Ron Bozeman or would it have Bo been? Bozeman who, was, Bozeman who was, you know, he was to, to the producers. He was the guy responsible to the producers. He was, you know, he was, I guess he was, uh, exec, you know, his, his titles changed all over the place. He was just like, you know, as far as we were concerned, he was the screws. He was the, he was the one of us who wasn't a dope smoking hippie. So, you know, so, yeah. so, so clearly he was made the boss because it, um, anyhow, uh, uh, we had fit, we shot all the shots at the swing outside around the, around the swing uh, in front of the house. And uh, as we did it, the idea came to me. And this is sort of how my career has always been. Think, shit just comes to me. I don't even know where it comes from. I just get like, just get, get hit like fucking like lightning. Things just happen and just pop out of my head. Uh, at the same time, I'm not a very disciplined study guy. If you sit me down, read this a hundred times and, and make up the greatest shots on earth, I'd probably come back to you and go, I don't know, I couldn't think of anything. We get on the set, I go, yeah, yeah, do this, do this, that. You know, that's just, and that's part of why my career in music video has been so successful because as you have to be, liquid and be able to change and, and, and come up with good ideas and, and adjust, right? It's a very free form kind of filmmaking. So anyhow, um, I had this idea, told to Toby, oh, brilliant, Daniel, brilliant, brilliant, man, brilliant, Daniel, go, go ahead and, um, did you ever get to interview Toby while he was alive? No, I wish I would have, you know, I wish I would have started this earlier, but. Yeah, uh, so anyhow, um, uh, yeah, down man, all right. Man, all down all right. Go ahead and do it. Yeah, I always had a cigar in one hand, a Dr. Pepper in the other hand. Toby did right, and uh, um, so I start setting it up. We had, I said, you know, we have sixty feet of track, and if I lay on my belly on this, we have a platform dolly that we would just put sticks on, and if I lay down on my belly and I hang the camera off the front, because the Claire and PR, the camera that we had, had a lot below the lens, but if I hang it off the front. And get the lens as low as I can, the camera as low as I can, 
I believe I can fit under the swing. And then I'll have this shot. It'll be this amazing shot of Terry's ass and these cutoffs, very sexy cutoff, minimal halter top she's wearing, or and not a halter top. I guess it's whatever, the minimal top she had. And um, and, and, and we'll go and the house will grow and you know, and I start the house will grow, 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 and just take over the frame, right? How brilliant down, set it up. He goes off for for, I don't know probably get another Dr. Pepper or whatever. He steps away for a moment. Anyhow, uh, Toby goes off. Bo, uh, we start to make the shot. Bozeman shows up. You know, Toby came over and said, what's going on? I said, oh, they're, they're not going to let us shoot the shot. And Toby goes, now listen. He goes, right now, I'm the director. He's the cinematographer. Maybe you're going to fire us. Maybe we're not here tomorrow. But right now, it's our show. We're shooting this shot. Daniel's come up with this shot. It's way, way, way too good a way to open the second act of this film. There's, you're not getting this to not, this, we're not not shooting it. Maybe you'll fire us. Maybe you got two different guys in here tomorrow, but for now, get the fuck out of our way. And on we went. What happened was um, their profit participation, right? And I had, so I have three and a half percent of the film, not for shooting it. I got, I got salary, but no percentage for shooting it. I got a percentage for finding one eighth of the backing. That's where my percentage came from. I didn't question about that actually that the whole the the financer you got your friend uh richard scenes Sines, yeah yeah um that got the ten thousand dollars there's a lot of crazy stories about him you know uh are any of them true i don't know if you've read them i haven't read them yeah they're, they're liable to be true um he was an excellent foil for us um what happened was he wanted to he was a guy that I knew that we, we'd go to see films so every three or four months. He'd ring me up. Oh, let's go see a movie. Richard uh, wanted, when, when Toby hired me, keeping in mind that I'm a 23 year old cinematographer and there's guys who later on became my friends, Vilmo Zygmunt and Laszlo Kovacs were like 40 and 38. They were the young guys making movies or working for Cormer at that time. I'm sitting here thinking, all right, this movie better start right away or those, one of those guys is going to get hired on this, on this film. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get to shoot this picture. I mean, they're crazy. I know what they're doing. I wouldn't hire me. I'm 23 years old. What the fuck do I know? How much could I know about filmmaking, really? Well, it turns out I had good intuition. I didn't know a lot, but I did know composition and I didn't know, I did design a lot of great moves. I had a lot of, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the ideas of these shots are, are, are mine. Um, but uh, I, I said to Toby, after I, first I said, I played it kind of cool. I go, yeah, man, I, I'd, I'd like to do it. Um, but, you know, I think I'd like to do it. Can I read the script? I would have said, yes, no matter what the hell it was. Well, I read the script and it's just, it's, it's just all there. I mean, the hair standing up on the back of my neck is fucking there on paper, right? I'm going like, holy shit. So I call back, I go, yeah, man, I'd like to do it. Again, playing it cool. When do we start? I'm thinking, this is, you know, this better be right away. He goes, well, Daniel, man, um, we're making this film for $80,000. And we got this oil lobbyist, Bill Parsley, also sometimes known as Jay. Uh, he's put up 70000 but he wants to know he's not the only guy in the world that believes in this. He wants somebody up to put up 10000 I'm going, oil lobbyist, Toby. Isn't, that's like, isn't that the enemy? Oil lobbyists? Like, you know, we're a bunch of hippies. We're going to fucking roll. He goes, yeah, Daniel, man, but they're, they got the money. We're hit. We don't have any money. The oil lobbyists, they got the money. I said, yeah, we know how they got the money. He goes, yeah, you got to forget that. Don't get over that shit. That they, we, they got the money by fucking, just, you know, they, they don't get too political about it. Just, uh, just know it. So I hung up the phone. I'm sitting there thinking, fuck, man, if this sits on the vine very long, I'm going to lose this job. And um, so I, uh, I, I'm thinking of Richard and I go, because, you know, every so often we go to the films together. And I call him up and say, hey, Richard, I go, I've been asked to shoot a film and they're looking for an investor. Oh, you know, he's like blowing me off. He says, oh, well, let me bring it out and you, you read it. Right? So I bring it out to him. He reads it. Three hours later, he calls me back. How much can I put in? It's fantastic. I want in. I said, well, they only want $10,000. That's all they need. But what happened, what was, what was incredible beyond getting the $10,000 that we needed to start the picture, which got me the four percent which i gave a little bit away to my grip and to my assistant uh but um 
it gave us the foil that any time that Parsley tried to put put us the screws on, put us you know get us put the screws to us, Toby said, "Would you like your money back?" He goes, "Because we, I'll have your money back here anytime. If you're not happy with what we're doing, and you want your money back, we'll give you your money back. You can go away." And so that proved to be an incredible foil. That I don't know if that's been spoken about much or not, but that was yeah. that gave Toby the power to run the show the way he wanted, because he knew that he could just flip it and just give you here's your money, get the fuck out of here. And we carry on. I was teaching at the University of Texas while I was getting my master's degree. So that's why I brought, Ted also was a teacher, teaching assistant there. That's why I brought my students. Lynn Sherwitz was one of my students. McClary was one of my students. Larry had been a teaching assistant before us. That's how we got to be so close with Larry and started working with Larry and, and Ted. So um, I, brought, I brought those guys onto it, um, you know, uh, what was what, what were we talking about just before that? I'm sorry. Well, I was always curious about why Lou quit. I, I'd heard oh, that. Yeah, he, he quit, but you know, uh, but oh, what I wanted to say to you, what actually is the case is his brother, Ron, his older brother Ron, yeah. was a cameraman on the job. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, another guy. I'd be interested in what the story is with Lynn Lockwood. Lynn. Oh, yeah, um, yeah was brought in to help light, basically to, to help do some lighting for a while, uh, wound up on a, on, on a second camera uh, at the dinner party or the dinner scene. And then I, I've seen a slate with his name in, in there, but I guess it because that was his slate. Now, what do you know when he came in? He didn't, I know he didn't start. And I know he didn't do the, when I was doing the night nice stuff in the woods, he wasn't there. And, I know he wasn't there in the end. Yeah, that's a good question. I've wondered about Lockwood as well, but also uh, J. Michael McClary, I thought he came in at the end for the final sequence. Jay was the, Jay was the second assistant. Yeah. yeah. He was, was the that second. after he was, Lou quit? He was, so he was the loader, and I promoted him when Lou quit. Mm, okay. As soon as Lou quit, Lou goes, oh, should I quit? I go, fine, turn to him, okay, Michael, you know. Um, but you're, you're right. Uh, Lynn Lockwood is on uh, the clapboard in those uh, dinner sequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not sure when. I don't know much about uh, Lynn Lockwood. I know more about uh, Michael McClary. Actually. Right. Well, J. Michael McClary. Yeah. Um, yeah. He he was. Yeah. Lynn. I don't know if Lynn's even still alive. I don't know. I know that they brought Lynn in uh, to help with some lighting, and uh, where he was. It wasn't, not, it was house interiors that he was around for. Uh, I don't believe, I know he didn't finish it because there's that, there's a shot of us where actually, where Marilyn's climbing into the pickup, it's the, the production photograph that was in uh, Texas Monthly. And actually uh, it's up on, it's up on the wall at the, in one of the Academy, Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Academy building, uh, buildings, which I'm really proud of and going, Fuck, man, we made it. We're on the wall at the fucking academy. You know, hell, I'm an academy member, so I've made it too. Yeah. But, um, uh, uh, but that's Lou, that's Lou, that's Ron Perryman is on the other. If you if you if you're familiar with that shot, yeah, Lou's come lumbering with the chainsaw towards her. It's after he's cut his leg. She's climbing into the pickup truck. It's a still photograph. Uh, Wayne Bell is over my. I'm on the camera right. A, a shot handheld. Uh, and uh, Wayne Bell is like obscuring most of me. The microphone's going right past my, you can't see my face because the microphone's running right through, through my face. That's, I'm holding one camera and then Ron Perryman from the back is on the, is on the left side. Yeah. Larry Carroll is, is to the left of, of uh, Ron Perryman. He was on set. He was working the slate, the slate that day. Yeah, but, I've seen uh, it, yeah. Lynn was, Lynn, so I don't know. I mean, I know they brought him in because they brought him in to help help me with lighting. Uh, you know, again, it was it was them trying to put the screws. You know, it was again them trying to put the screws on us to to make us do something. Uh, you know, that they thought could somehow go faster. Yeah, that's his credit lighting. But I was also curious about Ron Perryman when he uh, came onto Chainsaw. How much 
involvement he had. I've only seen him at the very end there for the final treat. He, he just that's he just came in that day. We needed another camera. Okay. And he was in that that last day, uh, and then he did, of course, uh, he did the, um, the he he built that wooden crane that makes the yeah the the, the uh, cadaver impaled show. Yeah, he was you know, a, a true part. Renaissance a true Renaissance guy. Yeah, yeah, Ron, you know, truly a Renaissance man. Also a part of that whole Richard Kidd and MPP and right, yeah. uh, Filmhouse. Yeah, you know. yeah, he was a partner. Yeah, but also Ron shot those photographs of the uh, whole uh, UT uh, Watchtower incident, and they were in uh, Life magazine. Ron's photos are, are in the, that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the uh, guy. Yeah, I wasn't there at that time. My brother was there. Hink Hinkley? Yeah, uh, Hinkley, I think, was the guy's name, wasn't it? Yeah, but now Toby says he was there, too. He was there that day, and I've heard all these different things about whether Toby went to UT or not, uh, whether he was self-taught. It's, it's always a different story. You know, <laughs> that's quite, it's actually quite incredible. Don't know if he, if he went to UT or, or not. If he was self-taught, we don't. I, I, you know, I, 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 I don't think he did. Basically, there, there was a thing about all of us were from film school, except for Kim, and Toby, and Lou, and Lou. And so that, so there was sort of this thing about oh, the, oh, the like you know, like you, the, the, we were the little kids, the film students. Yeah. So uh, I, I. I don't think that Toby went to university. I don't. I really don't think he did. The timeline doesn't really match up because the radio, television, film department started in uh, fall of '65. I've read, and when Toby would have went, you know, he was older than you guys. I'm, I'm not sure he may have been self-taught. Joe Bob Briggs, he wrote that article. I'm sure you've read it. We came, we saw it. It's a great article. But in that article, he talks about Toby Hooper going to UT for two years. Uh, to school we came we saw it. that's the that's the texas monthly article right yeah right it's a good article but that that in forbid i reached out to me and never uh, replied on where he got that information uh sure. under his real name john bloom he, he wrote that uh, but uh, i've also heard that toby went to to dallas and studied under a uh, sydney lumet's father he studied drama there that's you know. <laughs> well here's here's what i can tell you out of toby's mouth is that toby's Father owned a movie theater. Yeah, I've heard that too. I've heard he was born in a movie theater. And that Toby, you know, practically. I mean, you know, maybe. His mother went to labor in a movie theater. And the name of the movie's out there. He's always said that story. He told that Toby got Toby was born in a movie theater, and I was named by a television. <laughs> my parents, my birth certificate has male, child, pearl. And on the back, seven days later, is a stamp, and it's Daniel Carlton is written in, right? Mm -hmm. And I asked my parents at one point, I said, well, how come? I mean, most people get their name when they leave the hospital. They have their names on their birth certificate. And we didn't know what, we didn't know what we wanted to name you. We were unsure. We didn't know. And when we got back to the house, this is 1949, mind you. Mm -hmm. It was in New York area. The very first television, probably television broadcast wasn't even a year old. They had one of these little stupid, you know, fucking yeah. fishbowl, you know, goldfish bowl televisions. And uh, when I got there, Eddie Fisher was singing Danny Boy when they got home. When they came in the house, and they go, that's it. We name him Daniel. So wow. Toby was born in the theater, and I was named by a television. So yeah. Was, uh, I mean, there's all these crazy stories, you know, it changes. I've heard his parents own movie theaters, but it changes from San Angelo to all over the place. And then uh, one was like a chain of movie theaters. Some say his father was a hotel owner. You know, I, I don't know the truth there. And as far as when, what Toby, his, the movies he made as a child, uh, the story always changes. Yeah, he, he did make movies. A uh, stage musician, uh, a magician uh, as a child. I've heard that too. That makes sense. I was into it too. Because movie and magic, you know, movie and magic, they go together. Mm. That's what movies, that's what, that's what you learn right away. You get, before you get very deep into magic is that, oh, with an edit, I can do so much more in magic, you know, <laughs> with an edit. And your, your father, didn't he go to UT also? My father went to University yeah, of Texas. that's why you went. My father went, that's why my father sent, uh, yeah, because uh, I, I was not into it all, but my father, uh, my father was born of Russian Jewish immigrants. 
uh, and grew up in a, in, a, in a ghetto. They weren't poor by any stretch of the imagination, but it was a cultural ghetto. What ghetto was originally was a cultural enclave, not a financial enclave. It had to do with your culture. And so in the Bronx, there were the Russian Jews next to the Irish and next to the Italians. And um, my mother was Irish. Uh, my father's sister married an Italian. Uh, you know, and, and this is this is what they did. But my father, uh, you know, when he was of college age, goes, you know, my father was born in the United States. His parents, although they were from villages, probably not even, well, they both were within the country that today is Belarus, but they met in Montreal waiting to come into the United States, my grandparents. And my father, you know, he goes, why am I with these Russian Jews all the time? I mean, what the fuck? He goes, I'm American. I'm, you know, I don't know, why am I with these, why am I, why am I embroiled in this culture? I'm an American. And he goes, I'm going to the frontier. I'm going to Texas. And, you know, he applied to and went to the University of Texas. Now, whether this story is true or not, I'm about to tell you, you may know or you may know something about it. While my father was there, and I believe this might have been, I'm not sure what, year, maybe 38, 39, 40, I don't know what year it was. The, it was the Texas A&M game, the bonfire. The bonfire was set off, was firebombed from the air the night before the pep rally. Oh, wow. And the whole block, they would collect a block of wood. And at, at two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, somebody firebombed. It was the A&M rally, not the, not the UT. It was the A&M pep rally. Well, as you can imagine, big fire goes off and they know it was an airplane. And you can call around to the airfields and find out who's got an airplane flying to Texas in the, in the late 30s, early 40s at two o'clock in the morning. And uh, they got popped and my father got thrown out of the university. On the, oh, wow. At that point, then went and decided to go drop bombs on Japan instead. So uh, he, had a, he had a bit of a, a bit of a, of a thing going there, which my daughter now, I have a daughter now who's a pilot in the Air Force. She just oh, left. Yeah. She's been five, five tours of duty in Afghanistan. She's, she flies the Hercules C-130s. That's interesting. Me, me I'm, a, I'm a pussy. I, was a, uh, I did everything I could to stay out of the war. Yeah, yeah. My father enlisted and my daughter joined and me in the middle. I'm, I became a filmmaker because I didn't want to be in Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, I wound up becoming a filmmaker, so stay out of it. So your dad loved Texas so much to convince you know you to go there, and then oh, you what happened? My my father decided there was an energy. There was something about Texans. He never we never lived there. Yeah, right? he never went back. We went back to visit one time, but you know, but uh, he sent both my brother and I, my older brother and I, both. You know, he goes, look, you should go to the University of Texas. And why? He goes. It's a great, in fact, he liked the school. He actually he owned a company, a fleet of uh, construction, big construction cranes, and they were painted orange and white. My father he used oh, yeah. the UT colors as his, com as his company colors. Um, but uh, he, uh, he just thought that there was something very special about the way Texans sort of grabbed the bull by the horns, you know, and he, he wanted us to be exposed to that. And uh, again, I have to be thankful to him because that's, of course, my career. I don't... Yeah. To be honest with you, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I've, I've had a very, very successful career. And uh, I don't know that I would have been, uh, probably been a homeless person if it wasn't for yeah. cinematography and for Texas uh, giving me the opportunity to become a cinematographer because I'm not yeah. a very disciplined guy about, you know, like for me to show up at eight o'clock in the morning, you know, uh, 250 times a year on a dot, uh, that never would have happened. You know I mean? I just would have, you know, I just... I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly suited to this freelance life, you know, I mean, I go work and sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's five or six months, but whatever it is, it's over and done with. And I go to work with a bunch of other people. Yeah. That's sort of. Always know. paid respect to Toby though, for, you know, what he, what he did, uh, getting you the job. But I just think it's funny that, you know, he wanted a Texan to shoot the film, he said, and you you're thinking, I guess you were originally from Texas. He thought I, he thought I was a Texan. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, you know, I, at that time, I probably sounded pretty Texan. I'd been living there for, for, for six years, you know, at that point. So I probably had softened up a lot, you know. Uh, my, my New Jersey accent was definitely softened up. Uh, so, but, 
Yeah, interesting. I know you all left after Chainsaw to go to uh, California, I guess sometime in the well, later 70s. The, the very next thing we did after Chainsaw was a don't drink and drive uh, message oh. for the governor of Texas. Are you familiar about, you know about this? Yeah, I talked to Jack Hansen a little bit to try to get some information on it. Uh -huh. um, but they're kind of, and Ted, and they're kind of unclear on, you know, some things. But I think uh, for both that and the drug bust, didn't uh, you were the DP and wasn't uh, Ted the director? Uh, no, Larry Carroll was the director. Oh, for which one? For both. Both? Drug bust and the... Uh, and the don't drink and drive, although, yeah, I'm pretty sure that that was the case. Uh, but what happened was this don't drink and drive is about guys had an accident, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's all about this, the nighttime tra traffic accident, getting the body into the ambulance, boom, 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 you know, all about taking care of the person. And, and it is a low angle shot at the end and they, they slam the door on the, on the on the ambulance, and as the ambulance, excuse me, drives away, I tilt down with it as it goes, and there's this martini glass laying you know, in the middle of the road, right? That that the shot that comes and the ambulance goes off and gets lost behind the martini glass. Anyhow, we use so much blood. Yeah, we threw so much blood around because we were used to it from chainsaw. Dottie was on it as well in her makeup. And you know, it was blood was spurting, and you know, I, I, you know, I, you know, it was just like when we showed it to the, to the people from the state of Texas, they said, "What? What the fuck is wrong with you? We can't, we can't put this on television. Are you guys fucking nuts? This is way too gory and gruesome for television." In fact, the reality is, it was more gory than anything we did in Chainsaw. Chainsaw's not all that gory, really. Yeah. But that was a shootout. That was the right? first thing we shot after it was shootout. And then you guys uh, broke up. Um, I, I've heard uh, Ted said that you guys thought there was would be something in Austin still going on, you know, after Chainsaw. But um, I guess at, at some point, you, I know Larry and Ted both went to California, and they worked with Bob Burns. They worked on some films uh, like Tourist Trap there in '78. Right. Uh, but they they filmed a horror more, uh, more so Ted. Did, did you not? I know you got involved with music videos. I, I, didn't, I didn't go straight away because I had not yet, we shot the, mil, the film in 16 millimeter. Mm -hmm. And really the bulk of professional filmmaking go, had, took place on 35 millimeter. And I had not ever shot anything on 35 millimeter. And so I remained in uh, tech, Dottie, Dottie also came out to Los Angeles right away, uh, much sooner. Uh, and, but I stayed, uh, she and I split up, you know, we had many separations in our marriage. It was a stupid, it was on and off, on and off, on and off all the time uh, thing, uh, which my present, I'm 41 years with my present wife. So it's a very more stable thing. Uh, but um, anyhow, with, uh, she, she, came, she went out to Los Angeles. I actually went out to Los Angeles to get her to sign divorce papers and wound up back living with her again. But um, uh I was, I stayed behind uh, in Texas, uh, wanting to shoot something at 35 millimeter. So I, I, uh, Dottie went to Los Angeles. We sold our house in Austin. Uh, she went to Los Angeles and I went to, um, uh, I went to, uh, Dallas, moved to Dallas to try and get work in oh, 35 yeah. millimeter. Um, uh, uh, an Austin hippie with a Jewish last name. Dallas didn't want to know about me at all. It was a, it was a not a good move for me at all. I hung out there for a little while, but moved out to came to Los Angeles to, like I said, to get some papers signed, and wound up being invited to parties. And we go, you shot the Texas State semester. I want my off in, in my, I want you in my office on Monday morning. I'm going like, well, wow, this is Hollywood, and they're all interested, and I can't get fucking, you know, can't even get anybody to return a phone call in Dallas. So I moved on, uh, but I, I was sort of uh, later in the group to to uh, to come over. Yeah, but you fell into music videos. I, I guess it would have been the early '80s. It seems uh, rather than making features, was that just uh, you well, know? I, I continued to make. I continued to shoot films, uh, feature films, and I was a non-union cinematographer at that time, doing low-budget films, 
And uh, there was a guy, there's a guy named Russell Mulcahy, who was very much the guy in music video in the beginning of MTV. And he was a huge, huge Texas Chainsaw Massacre fan, right? He just thought it was the greatest film ever made. And uh, he was shooting, I think, I don't know if it was Billy Joel or who it was, he was shooting somebody here in Los Angeles and got, got fucked off with his cameraman and just like said, that's it, fuck it, I'm out of here and storming. And, and on, his way, on his way out the door, he stops and turns around, and this is told to me by his producers, and says, listen, if you want to get me to ever come back and shoot another music video in Los Angeles, you get me the guy who shot the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and walked out the door, boom. They then tracked me down. I remember getting a phone call. Is this Daniel Pearl? Yes. The Daniel Pearl shot the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I go, yeah, how many Daniel Pearls do you think there are? And they go, all right. Uh, they go, well, we need you to come to the Chateau Marmont, you know, where, where Belushi passed away. Because that's where, that's where Russell was at that time. Come to the Chateau Marmont and have a meeting. I went to there, had a meeting with Russell. He explained to me that we're going to, we're going to, have you ever worked on a telecine machine? I'd only been on film printers, which was a very antiquated way to color something. He goes, well, you can't believe the control we have over the colors individually, the gray, the, the color, the, the, the gray scale individually. We can really, so I said, well, yeah. So he says, so what I'm telling you is I need 64 shots in two days. You just have to get me the best quality you can, but you can't fuck me up. 55 or 60 will not work. I need 64 because he knew the pace of the, the editing pace of the film, the, the musical pace and where he wanted to cut. So he knew how many setups he needed to give it the filmic punctuation that to match the musical punctuation, that, right? So <clears throat> I did that, we went, we did it, we went to Telecine. Uh, we came out and said, you did a good job. You come on, come with me, I'll take you to a party. We went to, to the, uh, the, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the hotel and uh, on Sunset Strip, and there was a party and all the all the English direct. There was no no Americans were directing music videos at this time, eighty two, eighty three. There's none. It's all English uh, guys, and they were all holed up. All the there were more of the acts were here in the states, so five or six of them were all together at this party at the same time. We walked into the door of the place. They were like, there was a little landing and three steps down. And <clears throat> cleared the voice. Everybody, <clears throat> got the, turn down the music. He points to me and goes, this is the new guy. He shoots the music videos here from now on. Boom. And that was it. I mean, that, you know, next thing you know, I'm shooting Billie Jean and, uh, you know, Michael Jackson video and, you know, police every breath you take. And, you know, just shooting major videos, which oddly enough, you know, you can now put the cycle back together that the first film I made was cut to So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star. Right. So it was natural for me. I always, and in all the films that I made, while, that I made by myself were always the track. They were never, I didn't use actors as, you know, I just shot images to a track. So it's really the kind of thing that, that I was about from, from the beginning. Yeah, you got big ones. Uh, you know, Billy Jean, you got... Uh... Tons and tons, and you even got, I know, uh, Toby a job shooting a music video. Uh, for see my two, you see my two moon men there, right? My, on my shoulders, oh, my yeah. moon men. Uh, yeah, Toby, that's an interesting story too, because Toby had had a, a really rough time on Poltergeist. Really rough. Right. Of it. And um, a producer named Jeff Abelson uh, had an idea that he, would, uh, he was going to make one video in his lifetime. He was going to produce a Billy Idol video for dancing, uh, he went to Billy Idol and goes, I want to produce your next video and I'm going to do it in 3D. The old uh, anaglyphic 3D, the, the red and the blue green, like the old comic book sunglasses, 3D. And he was going to sell them in 7-Eleven, those glasses. MTV was all the rage. It was the biggest thing. We were on the cover of uh, Forbes magazine or Fortune magazine for saving the music industry. You know, it was, it was, it was, everybody was talking about it. It's what was going on, right? And, um, uh, the fuck was I saying? Is that uh, how you guys oh. reconvened? Uh, you and Toby, had you remained in contact? We had been in contact some, yeah. Uh, we had been, we actually had been in contact some. And so um, 
when Abelson went to Billy Idol, he goes, yeah, you know, you know and Abelson's idea was that he was going to sell these sun, these uh, glasses for fi- for a dollar a pair. He was going to make 50 cents a pair on the glasses. And he was going to make a million. He was going to sell two million pairs of glasses. He was going to make a million dollars, which in 83, he thought was enough money. And he was going to get, get in and get out, one job, in and out, done. That was his plan. So he goes, he gets, somehow he gets to meet Billy Idol. Billy Idol goes, oh yeah, you all want to produce my video? Well, get me the guard that directed Texas Chainsaw Massacre, piss off, right? So that was Billy Idol's way of getting rid of him. Well, there's a guy named uh, Keith Williams who wrote all these directors. They were basically all worked for one company, one or two companies in England. And Keith Williams wrote almost all the treatments. He was the on, he's the sort of the on celebrated genius in the early days of music video that wrote all these concepts. He, he would write, write them up, right? But um, Abelson goes to see him and goes, oh man, I've got this idea. I'm gonna make a million dollars in 1983. I'll be rich and in and out. He goes, but he fucking, Billy Idol said, I gotta get him the guy who shot Texas Chainsaw Massacre and nobody, nobody even knows how to get in touch with Toby Hooper, he's a recluse. Nobody's got his phone number. He doesn't return calls, he, nothing. No one knows where he lives. I can't even write him a letter. What the fuck am I gonna do? And Keith was living about three blocks from me in the Hollywood Hills. He goes, well, let's walk, we'll work up, walk up to Pearl's house and we'll explain it to him and he'll see if he'll take the idea to Toby. They come up, they tell me the story, boom, boom, boom. I, I go to Toby's house, I'm knocking on the door. Toby, is Daniel. You know, Toby, is Daniel. Come on, Toby. Let me, you know, he's a, he didn't want to talk to anybody. He's so battered and bruised from poltergeist. He's just, a, he's just he's a recluse. He's hiding now. Nothing's going on. I go, Toby, listen, I got an offer for you, man. Let me in. Let me in. You know, I'm yelling through the door. Brian and I hear some, the door unlocking. What's going on? He goes, yeah, what's going on, man? I said, you, 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 are you know what MTV is? He goes, I've been watching that shit. He goes, this is crazy. He goes, that's, that's all I've been doing is watching that shit. Last two months, I just sitting here watching that. And I said, well, Billy Idol wants you. To, goes, Billy Idol, he's, that's, he goes, that's the, you know, that's the best act on the, of all of them. That's the best act on the damn show, you know, on the, ta- on the channel. So yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll kind of try to wrap this up for you quickly. But um, we go off to do it uh, to- at the last minute. Toby goes, now listen, on, on Billy Jean, uh, and, 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 and some of your videos, man, you have, uh, I see like, like the storefront, but there's this whole city behind it. I think it was painted on glass as a glass painting. We just built the, the, the storefronts, you know, the five or six shops and the sidewalk that lights up for Billie Jean, but the rest of the whole world is painted on glass and I'm photographing through the glass, I'm photographing the set and the painting at the same time. Nowadays, there are much easier, better ways to do this, but in those days, that's how we made these composite glass shots. He goes, well, I need some of those. I go, no, Toby, you can't do that. He goes, well, why not? I said, we need that for the scale and dancing with myself. We need that. That's how I get, you know, a big shot at night and, and a shot down the side of the building, down to the street below, uh, the people climbing up the building. How am I going to get? I said, but Toby, if you do that, it, it's a trick to it. I said, it's the foreground appears to be the background. I have to get it all in focus. I use a wide angle lens and deep focus, but I have to get everything in focus but the foreground appears to be the background. And that won't work in 3D because in 3D, it's going to tell that the paintings in the foreground and not in the background. Mm-hmm. It's going to, it, it, it goes, we goes, well, then we're not doing it in 3D. <laughs> so, so now producers got a contract to make a Billy Idol video. Billy Idol didn't give a fuck about the 3D of it. Toby rules it out. And so boom, it's gone. 3D is out. So Jeff Abelson, his whole idea of getting rich in one job is gone. But what is, Toby gets nominated, first ever MTV awards, and Toby gets nominated for best director. Oh, wow. And what is, at that point, the hottest medium going, right? It is, this is what everybody's talking about. Everywhere you go, this is what, you know, this is a new, it's like Zoom, you know, at, at, at its time. This is what, this is what's going on. Everybody's excited about it. Everybody's talking about it. And then t- now Toby's suddenly one of the top players in it. And um, that was 
a huge, huge, huge shot in the arm for him to get him back up and get him back in the game. Rejuvenated his career. Totally I mean, rejuvenated him. With Cannon, I guess, and where mm-hmm. you guys made Invaders from Mars. Yeah, which I shot for him. Yeah. Right. From Mars, but uh, I tried to talk him out of doing the remake of Chain- the, his sequel to Chainsaw. Yeah, they wanted it, though, Cannon. He had to. He was signed to it. They gave him a three-picture deal. Yeah. He cleverly made Chainsaw the third picture. So they had to give him the other two. Life Force was first. Uh, I was shooting something in London. So I actually, I was shooting Genesis in London. So I actually was by, went by the Life Force set. Oh, wow. uh, it was always intended for me to shoot um, uh, Invaders from Mars. Uh, but after we were doing it, he, was, he had a rough time on Invaders from Mars. And um, I, 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 try, I told him, I said, Toby, don't, 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 don't do this. And he goes, I, I have to. I can't get out of it. That's part of my contract. I go, he goes, why, why do you, I said, Toby, I said, you made a film that is so highly regarded. We made a film that's so highly regarded. And now you're going to offer it up on a platter. If you go back and do a sequel, and if it's not as good, they were going to say, oh, Toby Hooper, he got lucky, you know? And he goes, well, he goes, I, I, I you know, I, I can't get out of it. There's nothing I can do about it. So. A lot of people love that film. Some like it more than the first. I mean, oh, uh, no, hang on a second. It's a great, uh, yeah, uh, it has a big fan base. That's got to be... That's got to be McConaughey and um, what's her name? Uh, for now. <laughs> oh, that was the one that Kim did. Oh, that's Kim's one, isn't it? That's right. But I don't know why Kim didn't come back for Chainsaw 2. I could never figure that out. And I haven't been able to... Kim hasn't really wanted to, you know, reach out well, to Again, I don't know this, and it's just conjecture, but uh, Kim and Toby, you would know better than me. I don't know if they ever did much of anything together ever again, did they? They were. They moved to California, and uh, Kim actually wrote the screenplay for Toby's follow-up to Chainsaw, uh, which was called Eat, it, it, many names, but Eaten Alive. It's what Eaten it's Alive, yeah. Known as. And they had a deal with um, a few uh, production companies, but somewhere along the line uh, it fell apart and kim was really unhappy i know with uh, eating alive and they had another sequel planned you know i've heard all these ideas one thrown around called uh, beyond the valley of the texas chainsaw massacre <laughs> I, I don't know uh you know too much about that look we were, we were, we were you know we were a bunch of young kids making a movie and we didn't know we didn't none of us knew a hell of a lot but all of us had fucking good ideas Really good ideas. The swing shot in my case, the the um, the the whole end scene of Gunner flailing, that wasn't even supposed to be shot. We were shooting Marilyn getting into the pickup truck and driving away, and Gooder's just there and he's just flailing and he just keeps flailing, and then he starts swinging, and then I start swinging out. You have to keep in mind that when we made that film, video assist does not exist. Right, yeah. Right? So only the guy, the cameraman with his eye to the eyepiece is the only person who's seeing the actual imagery that's going down. So in those days, the director would hang out close to the cameraman. So as Gunnar tells a story, a part of it is he's trying, that Toby is, um, Gunnar's moving and swinging and flailing. I'm moving around him and trying to keep the shot interesting and keep it kinetic as Gunnar's flailing. And, and Gunnar says that Toby is trying to keep up with me to get an idea just what I'm seeing from, you know, am I seeing his front, his back, his side? What am I seeing at times? And now Gunnar's decided that he's trying to get, scare Toby with the chainsaw. Yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> so he's swinging, right? And I'm in between the two of them. <laughs> and they were all sure, they were confident that everyone came running. They were sure that I'd gotten hit. Yeah. Uh, with the chainsaw when we shot it. But, you know, that, that, that in uh, something that I like a lot is an epiphany that I had when uh, Cedow, when the cook brings the, the hitchhiker back to the, to the house mm-hmm. and he stops and, and starts beating on him out, you know, outside the house. What had happened was I had been outside smoking a cigarette out front and uh, on the porch and uh, it was getting close to uh, lunchtime. 
and one car came down the dirt road and then Sally came behind that one with our food and our, the headlights lit up the dust that the first, the first car made, right? And I saw this and I go, holy fuck, that's how I'm gonna play this scene now. My, are you familiar with ISO or ASA at all? Are you much uh, a, a little bit. I'm not trained as a filmmaker or anything. Okay. Yes. Uh, but it has to do with the sensitivity of the film, right? Well, ASO. Yeah, a, 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 ISO and AI. Well, we shot it, I, the film on ISO 25. Mm -hmm. Today, we shoot ISO 800, 1600, 2500, 3200. They require, I needed for minimal, the very least little bit that I could expose a piece of film normally, 32 times as much light as we need today mm. to shoot, right? So it was pretty crazy. And um, I had them rig, I actually took the, in, in, in front of the headlights, I had them rig 1000 watt spotlights yeah. in front of the headlights and then, and then aim them because uh, the, the, the headlights wouldn't have been bright enough for me to shoot it with. And, uh, and then I talked to Ed, and, and, and if, you, if you watch the sequence, you can see Ed, he's doing a little bit. I said, now, Ed, the scene's gonna go on for a while, and I'm gonna stir up the dust before we roll, but I need to keep it up. So when you're, when you're down here scurrying around, make sure you stir it up for him. Just keep, yeah. keep, you know, in your acting, as you're dodging the stuff, keep stirring it up. So, so Ed is doing that as he's going on. You see, he's sort of, sort of as he's running around and trying to get away from him, as he's swinging at him, he's also at the same time shuffling, shuffling up the dust a bunch so the scene could go on for a while. Yeah, it's such a creative shot. There's many like that. I mean, the photography is beautiful in the film, but also I heard Toby came up with some unique shots. I know you guys are both in, in, inspired by like European art films and, you know, uh, obviously Toby's a, you know, very knowledgeable about cinema and yes. it's, it's a great film, horror or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, you know, he, he and I, we did, we, we bounced a lot of good ideas off, off one another, you know, and, and, and we did some stuff when I watched that film, you like, you know, there's, there's, there's scenes where, you know, we got fucking suns flaring through the, through the leaves and we're tracking, you know, Dolly and stuff like that, stuff that people were like putting, you can't shoot a movie without putting that in it today, you know, stuff that we were doing a long time ago. Yeah. You got any other questions? Um, I should I should probably let you go. You you've been you know very generous with your time. Cool. All right. Good talking to you. Good luck and um, take it easy. Yeah. Thank you so much, Daniel. Take care. You're very welcome.